Over the last decades, biology and medical research have been revolutionized over and over again. We can now read the whole human genome, which means that we get data from the roughly 3 billion base pair long DNA sequences of all of our chromosomes. While the original technology for sequencing the first human genome 15 years ago cost over $2.7 billion, we today only have to spend several hundred bucks. We also have more and more powerful technologies to edit genomes. Just some years ago, CRISPR-Cas9 was developed, a technique which allows the precise insertion or excision of genes. In this manner, we might be able to cure genetic diseases one day. However, there is still one field of research which is what is struggling, the discovery of new drugs. According to the FDA, 14% of all drugs in clinical trials eventually win approval. We only start clinical trials with drugs which have been extensively tested in cell cultures and in animals. Nonetheless, 86% of promising drugs fail. And there are many reasons why this is the case, one of which is that we use mice in preclinical phases. You see, many drugs which work in mice do not work in humans. And this is no wonder the last ancestor between mice and humans lived 80 million years ago. Although the bodies of mice fundamentally are quite similar to ours, there are still some slight differences which developed over the course of evolution. Therefore, we only find out if drugs are effective once we've started clinical trials. However, we might soon be able to drastically rise this number. We are currently working on more realistic systems in order to study the mechanisms of drugs in preclinical phases. These systems are called organoids and they derive from human cells. They are full of potential and we might even use them one day in order to generate organs. My name is Kevin Steinig and today we talk about organoids and how we might be able to generate tissues and organs in a laboratory. Okay, so what are organoids and how do we benefit from them? There are some differences in the exact definition of organoids, but broadly speaking, organoids are structures which resemble human organs. In other words, organoids are cell aggregations containing many different types of cells, such as muscle cells, neurons, or skin cells. And the way that these cell types are distributed is very similar to what we find in actual human organs. Although we cannot generate, for example, perfectly working human lungs, you will see that we've made actually great progress in developing more and more realistic organoids in the last years. Okay, so let's see how we can generate organoids. Organoids derive from stem cells in the laboratory. We've already discussed how we can derive stem cells from skin cells and how we differentiate them into different specific cell types. So make sure to check out these videos as well as they give you some valuable background information for today's topic. But just as a quick reminder, we can generate different cell types from stem cells by providing them with the right environment. This means that we cultivate stem cells with certain compounds, for example, to generate heart cells or to generate neurons. Okay, so you might not say that we could, for example, create different cell types out of stem cells in different petri dishes and then combine them in order to make organoids, right? Well, not really, because this would not lead to any specific structures which resemble organs. Instead, we can utilize a characteristic of induced pluripotent stem cells. They exhibit self-organization. Self-organization does not mean that stem cells know how to clean their room, meaning that they are organized. It means that stem cells themselves form these organ-like structures by mimicking development. So instead of making different cell types and throwing them into a single petri dish, we cultivate stem cells so that they undergo development themselves. So if you want to learn one thing today, then it should be the following principle. If you want to make certain tissues, organoids or organs, you need to provide stem cells with the right molecules. And in order to find out which molecules are necessary to trigger the development of organoids, we need to look at embryonic development and find out how these structures arise in the first place. You see, in the end, every part of our body arises from stem cells. So you need to identify which molecules are important for the formation of your structure of interest in the human body and then add them to the media in which your stem cells are. Subsequently, stem cells will start to follow their genetic instructions in order to form organoids. And in this manner, we've actually been able to generate organoids which resemble the brain, the kidney or the liver. To give you an example of how remarkable self-organization is, some years ago, scientists cultivated stem cells the following. They added specific compounds to the medium called basal membrane proteins and added only low levels of growth factors. 
Then the scientists observed that stem cells in the petri dish spontaneously started to form optic cups. Optic cups are special structures which arise during development and give later rise to the retina. And it is important to note that the scientists did not intervene with the shape of the cellular aggregates, meaning that stem cells formed the cups themselves. So if we know the principle that we just need to add certain molecules to stem cells, which are important during development, why haven't we been able to grow whole organs? The simple explanation is development is very, 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 very complicated. A lot of different factors and molecules are involved in order to make a whole human being. And it is not really possible for us to add all of these different compounds to the media. Moreover, and to make it even worse, the same molecules have different roles during different time points of development and in different parts of the body. So by adding a specific compound to our medium in which our cells are, we might foster the development of a part of an organ, but also hinder the development of another part. Nevertheless, we already use organoids quite extensively and we also make them more and more realistic. Therefore, I want to spend the rest of the video with you discussing different impressive organoids and how we can use them. And with that, organoid review. First of all, we can use organoids to study infections. In this regard, so-called cerebral organoids are especially interesting to us. These are organoids which mimic different parts of the brain and you can really think of them as tiny brains. They can size up to some millimeters. And just to make it clear, cerebral organoids are not conscious, they do not feel pain and they have no brain activity whatsoever. Nonetheless, it was found that their gene expression and their physiology is very similar to what we find in the fetal brain. Just recently, cerebral organoids have been used to reveal the cause of an epidemic. Some years ago, there was a mysterious outbreak in Brazil, which led to over 8,600 babies to be born with brain malformations. Scientists were puzzled and they tried to find out the causes of these incidences. And here, they started to use cerebral organoids to study what happens if we infect them with certain viruses. It was found that the development of cerebral organoids was heavily disturbed after being infected by the Zika virus, and so the Zika virus was identified as the main cause of this outbreak. Furthermore, we might also use organoids to study genetic diseases and develop therapies. To give you an example, in another video we talked about cystic fibrosis and gene therapy. In this disease, a single mutation near gene CFTR leads to the production of abnormal mucus in the digestive tract and in the lungs. We can now study cystic fibrosis by isolating skin cells from CF patients and then convert them into stem cells and intestinal organoids. These intestinal organoids now look very similar to the intestine and they also harbor the same mutation as the CF patient. Using this system, we can now try to develop gene therapies. In 2013, CRISPR-Cas9 technology was used in order to introduce intact CFTR into these cells. As a result, the shape of the treated intestinal organoid, which has been originally very distorted, started to look healthy again. So you can see that we can use organoids in order to study genetic diseases and also develop efficient therapies. Last but not least, we also can potentially use hepatic organoids in order to screen for and predict acute liver toxicity. You see, the liver is a central part of our metabolism, meaning that it breaks down and also slightly changes drugs. In this process, some drugs might become toxic and start to kill liver cells. And this is especially often happening in anti-cancer drugs. We can assess this risk by testing new drugs on hepatic organoids, which mimic the physiology of the human liver. But this kind of screening is still under development. There are many other remarkable organoids we've not covered in this episode. Thymic organoids, for example, mimic the structure of the thymus, but we also know pancreatic organoids or also lung organoids. Then there are also gastroloids, which are organoids which mimic early development. So I pass down the question to you. Do you want to hear more about these different organoids? And what do you think? How important will organoids become in the next years? And can you imagine growing whole organs from stem cells? Would you use these organs for transplantation and would you also accept such transplants? I really want to know your answers as I'm very engaged in this kind of research. So if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe, meaning hitting these two buttons here and also tell all your friends about the fascination of organoids. <laughs> and with that, I'll see ya.